Good morning and welcome to another episode of Integrated. This is the podcast where we seek to grow knowledge of God by coming to know ourselves and what we were made for. By bridging the gap between the intellect and the will, we have the capacity to understand our nature and grow as disciples of Christ, surrendering all that we are and all that we have to the truth. My name is Angela Erickson, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about my home birth. And when I say a little bit, I mean a lot of it. That's what this whole episode is about. Um, I Sorry, my allergies are really bad. So if you see me rubbing my nose a lot while I'm recording, that would be why. Um, I feel like whenever it rains a lot, my allergies just get really, I don't know, they flare up a lot. So um, so my sincerest apologies. I can hardly help myself. Um, I do it without even noticing. I've always, I've had it, bad allergies since I was a young kid. And yes, I know I should be eating like local raw honey every day and and trying to do more to support my body, but I can only do so much in a day. Okay. Um, anyway, at least just like the remembering, but anyway, so thanks for those of you who are new here. It's so great to have you joining us on this journey. I hope you enjoyed my episode about my health journey. There were a lot of things I didn't quite get into, but, um, I'm hoping that I can sort of round things out a little bit with this episode and, um, and really provide some insight and hope and some hope. Like that's, that's really what I want for you guys. I want this to be an episode of hope, uh, especially for those of you who are afraid of being pregnant or feel like you're a bad Catholic because you're not open to life right now. Or, um, for anyone who's just afraid for God's plan for their life right now, I see you, (laughs) I see you, I see you, I see you. So, uh, if you haven't already, please hit the like button, subscribe, share this episode. I would really, really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, make sure you let me know what you think. Feel free to comment below on YouTube or uh, leave a review. I would really appreciate that. But what has your experience been with childbirth or um, have you had a home birth or uh, have you, what has your hospital births been like? I would love to hear more about that. But as we uh, get going on this episode, a couple of things. Um, I apologize if this, uh, the next, I don't know, several weeks, I'm not on social media as much. I'm getting ready for our homeschooling year. So that's what I'm diving into. I will be having Bill Rivers on to talk about uh, his books um, before we get into the homeschooling year. So that if you're looking for books to read, to your young boys or what have you, uh, I would, I hope you'll be subscribed and you can listen in on that interview. I have some really great interviews lined up coming up here. Um, like with Daria Little, I am going to be talking about her conversion from Islam to Catholicism, kind of the process she went through. She's just a lovely human being. I love her so much. So I'm really excited to have her on. Um, and then I'm also going to be interviewing Jeremiah Bannister, who's also known as the Paleocrat. He uh, does his own stuff, but he also does stuff with the meaning of calf now, um, or meaning of Catholic. But uh, his story with losing his daughter, we're going to be talking about that. It's going to be kind of a gut-wrenching episode. So uh, I really hope that you'll tune in. His his story is really incredible. And for those of you who have paid any attention to his work, he's very energetic. Um, and just He's just a really good guy to talk to. So I'm really excited about some of these upcoming episodes. Um, so anyway, I guess I'll just get started now. Okay, so I guess we basically left off where I told my priest I was pregnant and um, And I had just gotten done a couple of weeks prior telling him that I was deathly afraid of getting pregnant again. My fourth child, uh, if you haven't listened to my previous episode, I'll just give you a little bit here, but definitely go back and listen to it to kind of get the full, a fuller account of of what transpired. But um, my fourth child was very difficult. He still kind of is actually, Um, but he had horrible oral ties and they really messed up his whole body. And in that journey, working with him on trying to uh, move him past some of the extreme colic and sleeplessness that we were experiencing, I came to learn a lot more about how integrated the human body is, especially when it comes to this tissue that seems pretty minor in in the mouth, but is connected to fascia throughout the body. And that fascia works with the the nervous system to send signals to the brain. And so um, if if that's not working properly, if there's a restriction or, or if something else is going on, it can really impact a lot of different areas of brain development, um, sensory integration, kind of those primitive reflex integrations, the the moral reflex or all these other things. And if these things don't integrate properly, 
then then what happens is that the body is constantly in a state of dysregulation. It's kind of, it's, it's always in that fight or flight mode. And so when the body is extremely sensitive or stressed out, you can imagine that impacts every other aspect of your life. It impacts your sleep. It impacts your ability to activate the parasympathetic nervous system to calm down and to be in a relaxed state. Um, it can cause issues with ADHD and ADD among some other issues. So it just, it really blew my mind how, again, integrated the mind and the body are. And of course that impacts our soul, right? Like he's, he's too young to really understand that. So hopefully we can, we can continue to cultivate things better within his own body, regulate it a little bit better so that he can be more disposed to a full spiritual life. Not saying that any of us who are not dysregulated aren't disposed to that, but there's just no doubt in my mind. I think all of us would agree that if we're hungry, if we're exhausted, all of those things really contribute to an inability to flourish spiritually, um, unless there, there's a really significant amount of grace in that area from God. If, if he's calling us to something in particular, and then there's then there's a certain grace that comes with that but um but yeah we have a duty to treat our bodies with respect and to take care of them they are a gift from god and they are temples of the holy spirit so um that was something that i was working through as i prepared for the birth of of veronica my fifth child because i hadn't been taking care of my body i was extremely malnourished i was dysregulated i wasn't um, I wasn't getting enough sleep because I was trying to deal with this child who also didn't sleep, but also I wasn't nourishing my body. I wasn't feeding myself. So I was extremely underweight when I got pregnant with Veronica. Um, and mentally I was not doing well. I was, uh, like I said, very depressed and at times kind of, uh, diving into some dark areas mentally and just really struggling with spiritual sloth. Um, and, and a lot of despair. There was a lot of despair. So when I found out I was pregnant, that was like the worst thing in my mind because I thought, how on earth? Like, if I have another child like Elijah, I will, I will no doubt be in a mental institution is what I said. I mean, I, I just, I thought there's absolutely no way I can do this again right now. We, we, we have, uh, we, at the time we had four already born, um, children who were still very young. When I finally did have Veronica, she, she was number five and my oldest is just turning seven today, actually, on, on the ninth. So, you know, th things were happening quickly. And that can be really scary, um, especially when you have kids. And, and I, you know, don't get me wrong. I know that there are families that have, it, you know, have, have challenges that far exceed my own. Um, you know, I, I think I realized at that time when I was struggling the most with being so dysregulated was that there were parts of me that were coming out of my parenting. And I think a lot of us can relate to this, but there were things that I was seeing in my own parenting that I had promised myself I would never exhibit. Um, things that maybe I had experienced and things that scared me, to be honest. And I just, there were so many times when I thought I'm going to traumatize my children because I'm hormonal and I'm dysregulated and I'm not sleeping and I'm not eating and all these things. Um, I wasn't, being disciplined in the ways that I needed to be disciplined. And I'm not just talking about um, in terms of temperament, but even sometimes feeding yourself is a matter of discipline. Um, it's easier, especially as a mom, when to get things done when your kids are preoccupied with food or often we don't get to eat because our kids keep asking for food, even after we've made it. Or they won't eat their lunch and then they want 50 snacks afterwards. Um, you know, it's just stuff like that where you sort of get lost in, in the muck and mire of those tedious daily tasks. And so it wasn't intentional. Um, but by the time I found out I was pregnant with Veronica, I just, I, I was not in a good state. So moving forward a couple of months, um, things really came to a head in my marriage. My husband was working really hard. He was coming home and was having to do more work at home because I just, I was slogging through every single day, trying my best just to survive. And after a, an argument, I guess we don't, we don't fight hardly ever, but he was extremely frustrated and I was extremely frustrated 
you know, that, there were things that were not being spoken that maybe should have been. I just didn't know how to articulate to my husband um, where I was at at that time. And um, anyway, we made a plan when we finally came and, and had a meeting of minds. We made a plan, and that was a really important part of my healing journey. Um, my husband has always been just an incredible man. Um, he has allowed me to have this space to heal. And I think as a, as a husband and as a protector, that is part of your role. Um, you need healing too. I think a lot of men need healing as well, but for a lot of women too, especially those of us who grew up in environments that maybe, um, we didn't thrive in, uh, for whatever reason, whether there was trauma or just unhealthy relationships, things like that. Um, I've never lived, I've never been in relationship with someone where I felt like I didn't have to earn their love and respect. Um, and, and my husband created that space for me within our marriage. And it took me eight years into our marriage to realize that I finally felt safe enough to start addressing some of the wounds that I had in my life. Wounds that I at times didn't even realize were present, but I was seeing some of those wounds come up within me. Um, even when I was pregnant with Veronica or, you know, struggling with Elijah, when I was experiencing bouts of postpartum rage, which I didn't know was a thing or, you know, all, all of these different areas, kind of that sense of unworthiness and um, despair and, and examining my childhood through a different lens, um, especially as a parent. So there were a lot of things going on in my heart and, and I was trying to piece things back together and find healing. And my husband created a space for me to do that. Um, so that was kind of the first step of my healing journey was, was knowing I absolutely had his, uh, support. He was going to help make room for me to find healing and peace. And then I could start to tackle this pregnancy because I just, I didn't want to be pregnant. It was, I was like a form of shell shock kind of, I just, I didn't want to think about it. And so I didn't, which to be fair, I mean, the first trimester I was, I was kind of sick with like morning sickness or whatever, but it wasn't debilitating. Um, but mentally I was at a block. There was a huge mental block. And then I spent my entire second trimester very, very sick with things like COVID. I got really sick with COVID and ended up with pneumonia and all kinds of stuff. It was intense. That was, um, definitely the most sick I've ever been in my life. And then after that, because my immune system was so shot, I just kept getting sick after that. It was like one thing after another was, you know, influenza and another um, pneumonia scare and all kinds of stuff. So I was in and out of the doctor's office quite often during my second trimester because um, my body just wasn't healing. It was having a hard enough time just being pregnant um, and my immune system was, was not doing well. So I finally got to about 28 weeks of being pregnant. I sort of realized that I had to take ownership of this pregnancy in uh, in a more serious way than I had before because I had never had a home birth before. This was my first time having a home birth. And I, I, I just knew that I didn't want another hospital birth after Elijah and, and some of the things that I've experienced in the hospital that um, I don't know that I'll get into them here in this interview. If you want more information, feel free to, to message me or, or let me know if you want me to talk about some of those things. I didn't have anything extraordinary happen during my, my labors in the hospital, my, my deliveries, but there's so many things that I question now um, because the, they were kind of told, it, it was told to me that these things were normal or um, required, or this is just what you do. You don't, I just didn't have enough tools to ask the right questions because I didn't know what questions to ask. I didn't know anything about pregnancy or, or delivery, um, which is kind of one of those things that as I started to, as I started to pursue my home birth and embracing it and embracing that I was going to have another child is surrendering to God's will for me at that time. Um, 
my heart really changed a lot. But one thing that really helped me, and I'll, I'll, when I got to about 20, 28 weeks, I started taking a bath pretty much every day, an Epsom salt bath, just to help me relax and uh, support my body. And I would sit and read. And I read several books, actually, uh, in the last trimester of my pregnancy. Mostly were cent- they were centered around feminism and Catholicism, kind of the intersection of, of trying to understand these things, what happened in the feminist movement. Anyway, from a Catholic lens. But anyway, so one book that I read, though, that I want to share with you guys is called Made for This, The Catholic Mom's Bi- Guide to Birth by Mary Hazeltine. Here it is. I'm going to show it up here on the screen. Um, but it is just an outstanding guide for women who are planning to have a home birth. I was listening to the podcast. Um, I was, she actually has an app now, which came out shortly after I had Veronica. So I definitely checked that out. But um, I was listening to different podcasts about home birth and watching home birth videos. Believe it or not, I had never seen anybody give birth until I started preparing for my home birth. How crazy is that? Okay. And this is where I'm going to get on my soapbox here a little bit because that's weird. I had given birth four times and I had never once actually watched somebody else give birth. I'd never seen another woman give birth. And that to me is really disturbing because motherhood and every aspect of motherhood is so ingrained and a part of our nature that women shouldn't be having their fifth child and finally getting curious enough to see what it looks like. I was always, I think I was always afraid to see what it looked like. Um, I don't, I don't even really know why. Uh, probably because every movie displays pregnancy and labor is like the worst thing ever, the most traumatizing, painful experience ever. And I had to watch other women give birth before I could really appreciate how absolutely incredible childbirth is. Like I I cannot describe to you how incredibly powerful it is when you sit there and you examine, first of all, that Christ himself was once the size of an embryo. He was min- he was microscopic. All of God contained the nature of God contained within a microscopic organism, human organism, and grew. And then women, we get to embody being arcs of the covenant, bearing the image of God within us, within our own children, and in a forceful way, um, in a really powerful way, bringing life into the into the world, oh, a soul, bringing a new soul into the earth. Um, and, and those souls exist for all of eternity. I mean, it's like, how can you think there's nothing more powerful? And yet Satan has tricked women into believing the lie that there's nothing that that pregnancy is is problematic. It needs to be medicalized. That fertility is a disease. And that's the thing is, it's like, I'm not railing necessarily on providers within uh, the medical field who are in obstetrics or things like that. I'm not, that's not my thing. Um, I understand that these people have a paradigm that they view motherhood and pregnancy through. Uh, But I do think that the institution within which they operate is wrong. Like, I think the mindset that they have is wrong. Um, fertility is treated like a disease from the time that you're a child. It's like women, the second they, they start their cycles as teen, as young teens, you know, this, this is something that needs to be intervened. It needs to be counteracted. It needs to be stopped. Um, that's why these people are so excited about, you know, putting kids on puberty blockers and things like that. We want to defy natural law. We want to defy and be our own gods. We want things to be on our own terms instead of embracing this powerful gift that we've been given. We're going to treat fertility like it's a disease. We're going to actually give you cancers and things like that. We would much rather push these pills on you that make you sick than actually help you embrace fertility and a part of your own um, nature. You know, we'll we'll reject nature entirely. And then that stems into pregnancy because what happens, you know, these kids uh, or, you know, obviously women were getting pregnant and then they have to go, well, this has to be micromanaged. This has to be 
intervened. This is problematic. This, and I'm not saying there's never, there are always those cases where, yes, a cesarean, that was the, that's what needed to happen. Um, I, I'm not talking about those exceptions. I'm talking about the norm. A normal, your average healthy woman is going to have a normal physiological birth because her body is designed for it. Our bodies are designed to push things out of our body every day. If you're healthy, you're having a bowel movement every day and your body is designed to help that process. It's a physiological thing. You don't have to think about it. And birth is the same way. And why is it that it didn't take, it took me until my fifth kid to realize this, that I didn't need coached pushing. That in fact, coach pushing could actually cause more problems to a woman's pelvic floor than letting her body do the work. Why didn't I realize that I didn't need Pitocin after every single delivery the second I had the baby? You know, what are these things doing to prevent women from bonding properly with their children, like epidurals and things like that? Why didn't anyone tell me that some of these interventions that are, are mainstream and normal could result in a cascade of more interventions. Why is, I just have so many questions. And as I started to prepare for my home birth, I just felt so much more equipped um, than I ever had been. I've never done like a, a hypnobirthing thing where people are like mentally preparing every single day. This was my mental preparation. It was just the the ground level of like understanding labor, pregnancy in a new way embracing that aspect of my own womanhood in a new way, in its entirety, and grieving the loss of the collective wisdom that women have had for centuries that is no longer passed down because we've medicalized birth. You know, women were giving birth at home forever, and their their children were seeing what sex is about. You know, what is sex ordered towards? It's ordered towards children. And so here they're used to seeing Women in their community, their moms, their aunts, all these other people, their older sisters, they're, t- they're, they're tending to those births um, and, and seeing what it's all about. Why do we have sex? It's not just because it feels good, but because it's the, it brings about the creation of new human life, new souls that are meant to be in the kingdom of heaven for all of eternity with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what this is about. And women aren't even seeing what's happening because we put it away in a room. We, we put these women off. And, and don't get me wrong. I am, I'm somebody that loves to be alone when I'm in labor. Sorry, I had to add a uh, Elijah here. He's hanging out. Um, but anyway, so, so I just, it, it, I sort of almost had to grieve this, this lost wisdom and sort of realize that I, I want to break that cycle within my own family. Um, And so this was an opportunity for me to do that. So as I approached um, the birth of my fifth child, Veronica, I spent a lot of time in prayer. And actually, before I even get into that, before I get into like the actual birth story, um, for any of you, I've talked to so many of you who are interested in having a home birth um, or, you know, or are in the process of, of finding a midwife right now. I've been asked several questions about um, how to find a midwife. So I'm going to just go through some of the questions from this book made for this birth. If you are interviewing a midwife, these are the kinds of questions I would ask, or even even a provider uh, at a hospital, if you're still planning to do hospital birth for whatever reason, um, I would ask a lot of these questions and definitely get this book if you're wanting um a more in-depth look at all of this stuff. I mean, she covers so many excellent topics from a Catholic perspective, and I just, I really love it. Um, But here's some of the questions that you should ask when you're interviewing a midwife. Um, You know, do you work with other providers who will be at, who will be at my birth? Um, Do you, so this would be more at the hospital, but do you perform episiotomies? Uh, What is your policy on artificial induction and labor? Um, what's your cesarean rate? If you're, if you're laboring in hospital, you need to ask these questions. Um, if, if you're, because that's the thing is OB-GYNs are not, they're trained to be surgeons. That's what their job is. That's, that's what, that's their expertise. Their expertise is yes, birth, but more, more, um, specifically surgery for a cesarean. So, um, ask more about the IVs and, uh, what kind of ph- pharmaceuticals are used in labor. 
all of these things. And then if you're talking to a midwife, um, you know, I would ask some of some of these questions as well. But um, even to expand on that, one thing I would want to know if you're talking to a midwife is um, what their preferred method, like what their communication style is. Um, I found that I kind of wish I'd asked some more of those questions because, um, you know, even though I liked my midwife while I was, while we were going through the process, she's definitely more quiet than I am, which is fine. My husband's a very quiet man. That doesn't bother me. Um, but I could see that when we, when I went into labor, I sort of felt like, um, I almost had to convince her that it was time for, like it was go time in a, in a sense. Um, even though it was my fifth baby and I, I'm not new to this, I sort of felt like I had some convincing to do, which, um, you know, doesn't make sense. Maybe talk to your provider. If you are, if you're not a first time mom, uh, make sure you're very clear about what your labors typically look like so that, because honestly, the you as mom, you're going to know better than anybody. You know your body better than anyone. And two, the thing that I found when I was in labor is that your body, if you go more into this instinctual um, place, I guess, internally while you're in labor, which, which most women do, especially when they hit that end, the transition phase of labor, but your body naturally will tell you the best positions for you to be in and things like that. So your intuition is going to guide you in a lot of ways, you know, if there is fetal distress or not. Um, anyway, it's just, you know, some of those questions I would, I would ask, like, what's your communication style? Um, be very clear about what your labors look like, or even if you know what, it, I mean, it's different for every woman, but maybe it might be a little bit helpful to know kind of what to expect based on your mom's experience or your grandma's. Like, I have really large babies at birth. My mom didn't, but my grandma did. My grandma had big babies too. So um, just kind of knowing some of that history and collecting some of that information and wisdom from within your family is really important as well. Um, but anyway, so when I got into labor, I had finally come to terms with the fact that we were having another child. And I was, uh, I had been implementing some dietary changes to help support my body more. And that was making a really big difference for my mental health and state. Um, and maybe we could talk about that sometime too, but I'm, I'm kind of becoming a proponent, proponent of what's known as pro-metabolic eating. Um, I do think that it is starting to heal my thyroid quite a bit and my metabolism. Um, and I'm not even doing it very perfectly. I bet if I was really rigid about it, I could see even more progress, but I'm just not an, when it comes to stuff like that, I'm not necessarily an all or nothing person. I kind of like to ease into it. So while I was, I was easing into these new changes, lifestyle changes too. I mean, focusing on really getting some sleep, um, the best that I could and doing all these things, having a plan in place. We hired a postpartum doula for after I gave birth to help out around the house so that I could make or have meals made, um, and focus on, on the nourishment and the rest that I needed, uh, because that was a missing piece with Elijah, obviously. Uh, so that was kind of one of the things we did to put a plan in place. And that helped allay a lot of my fears surrounding pregnancy, because honestly, it wasn't the pregnancy part I was afraid of. It wasn't even the labor, labor part of it. Um, it really was the postpartum phase that I was really afraid of. Um, I was, I was really struggling with that mentally. And I knew that that mental block, I was afraid that it would kind of transfer into my labor. And I do think that it kind of did. Um, I went into labor on Friday night and late at night. And by Saturday morning, I texted my midwife and said, after taking a bath and my, my contractions were not going away, I said, I'm in labor. I just want to let you know. Um, so, you know do with that what you will, basically. And I continued to labor for a day and things just didn't seem to be progressing the way that they had with my previous births. I mean, I think I mentioned in my, my episode pre prior to this one, when I gave birth to this guy, Elijah, um, it was a very, it was like my first textbook labor. It was easy. Um, and not that it's ever easy, but 
by comparison to my other labors. I mean, those labors, my contractions were usually, um, you know, my contractions, I'd have these two minute long contractions with like a 30 second break in them for that was me from like four centimeters to seven, you know, like that middle active labor phase. Um, it was exhausting. And even with my second, he was posterior. And so lots and lots of back labor as well. And that's why with him, I did have an epidural. I had an epidural with my first two kiddos. Um, but they, I had such an adverse reaction to both of them that I became determined by my third kiddo to not have any more epidurals. So um, didn't have one with Paige. I didn't have one with Elijah. And obviously I didn't have one at my home birth. So uh, I went into labor and was just like, this is not how my labors normally go. This is, this is taking a really long time. We got to the 24 hour mark and I was still in labor and still trying to get through. I mean, they were, the, these were contractions for most of the day that I couldn't really talk through or anything. So, um, I knew that we were definitely progressing into labor. It wasn't near prodromal labor. It wasn't my body just preparing for labor. I was in labor and I, I started once, once we got into, um, Sunday, and the kiddos were still there and I was, I, I needed some space just to be able to finish going to labor or figure out what was going on. It was just too hard with all the little kids um, hanging around. So they actually got picked up by my, my mother-in-law. They went to a birthday party um, for their cousin and there is a little quieter in the house. So that kind of helped. And, and that's one thing too. I think if you're, if you're, having a home birth, prepare your home for birth. Okay. So like one thing we did was we had our priest come and he blessed the entire house and an old, um, traditional blessing. He also gave me a traditional blessing as a pregnant mother, um, and blessed the baby, blessed Veronica in utero. Um, he also, uh, blessed salt for us and candles and things like that. Um, so we, we tried to prepare the house spiritually and then also in a physical sense, you know, having dimmed lights, not like the super bright, shiny lights that you get at the hospital, but dimmed lights helps release oxytocin in the brain, which helps stimulate contractions. So I was very intentional about creating that sort of ambiance that you would get at a restaurant. That's also why restaurants have dimmed lights, um, especially more romantic restaurants. Uh, it's because they're trying to stimulate oxytocin in the brain, that bonding hormone that between couples and things like that. So it, it all kind of ties together. You'll see a lot of people hang lights and, and, you know, do different things. I did candles in my room. I had Latin or Gregorian chant music playing while I was in labor in the overnight hours, especially, um, and trying to do everything I could to relax and meditating on sacred scripture. So, uh, while I was getting into kind of the hardest part of my labor, I was mentally exhausted. It was probably 35 to 40 hours into labor. And I, I wanted to give up. I, I've never been in labor that long. Um, and I do think that mental block of trying to prepare to have another child was just, uh, I think that, that prevented in a sense, like physiologically, my body was responding to that tension, even if it was somewhat subconscious, but Veronica was not in an optimal position. So she was posterior, which means that her face was up. Usually you want the face facing back towards the spine. That's a more optimal position for the baby to be born because, and I'll use Elijah as an example. If you have the head tucked down, Elijah, would you tuck your head down? You get the top of the head going through. Okay. If the baby is posterior, they can't tuck their chin in the, the same way. And so you get the full circumference of their head coming out at that time, which is, um, it, it's more challenging and it can be a little bit harder on the pelvic floor. So um, so anyway, she was posterior and I just felt like she was stuck or something. And I remember texting my midwife cause I hadn't heard from her since that I texted her early at Saturday morning at like one or two in the morning. Um, and I just said, you know, things aren't progressing. So I was texting my midwife and trying to discern, you know, does she need to come and check something out? Like what, it, you know, I'd heard of 
women having cervical lifts or all kinds of stuff. I don't know. I didn't know what was going on. I just knew that this wasn't my normal after, you know, four other births. And um, my husband, after, finally, he helped me with what's called a side lying release. We'd been trying different positions from spinning babies. I don't know if, if you're familiar with that, but basically spinning babies is kind of a program um, that gives you stretches and exercises to help the baby get into an optimal position. Now I haven't done like everything. There were just maybe three or four um, positions that I was trying throughout, you know, my third trimester and during labor to help Veronica get into a better position. And uh, my husband helped me with what's called a sideline release. My pelvis always gets super crazy twisted. Um, I know that's very, very common for most women, but um, my, my body wouldn't have relaxed and hits. It's like, um, it's just crazy how, you know, just how loose my joints and everything gets. So I, I had a feeling my pelvis is still very twisted and my husband helped me with this side lying release. So what happens is you lay on your side. And so we lay, I laid on my left side and, um, my husband was hold you, you lay on your left side on like a, a table or a bed right on the edge. And he, you have someone like your husband supporting your hip, your top hip. Um, so he had his hands on my hip and I took my right leg, which is on top, and I leaned it over the bed and put it down in the middle of a really intense contraction. I was bawling. I was, I was in so much pain and I was so mentally exhausted and I just felt like, is this ever going to end? It was kind of, it was getting to that point where I just you know, mentally I, I can usually do labor pretty okay, but this was because it had been going on for so long. I was exhausted. I hadn't slept in two nights. So anyway, I pulled my leg up and as I brought my leg back up, my husband and I heard and actually felt this huge pop. You could see his hands shake because my pelvis popped. And what we kind of think happened is that Veronica maybe was stuck like by her shoulder or something, which is more common if you have a baby that's um, posterior. But uh, once that happened, I, I just remember looking at my husband like kind of shocked and thinking, all right, this is it. It's go time. And I labored a little bit more just out um, in our bedroom just to make sure that I wasn't wrong. And as my contractions started to intensify again, finally, and they were coming closer together, I got in our laboring tub and my husband was, you know, getting new water in there. He's taking some water out and pouring hot water in there or getting hot water in there from the bathtub. It was crazy, but I knew that this was it. And finally, I don't know, maybe an hour or so later, it's hard to tell when you're in labor, how fast time is going. Um, but it wasn't too long after that, that I texted my midwife and said, all right, uh, you need to get here. She lives about a half, a half an hour away. Is that it's it's time. So the end of labor is just amazing because your your brain automatically goes into those most primitive places, and because it, it can't, the rational brain it doesn't do anything for you really uh, when you're in that point of labor because your body is so focused on getting this child out. And, and, and working together. I mean, for me, when I'm in labor, I always, I always think of myself and the baby as a team. Like we're doing this together. Um, you know, my job is to help the baby get out and we're going to work together. Um, so, uh, because really too, the, the baby's brain is releasing signals to the mother's brain to tell them when to labor and things like that. It's, it's amazing. This, the bond between a mother and her child, it's, it's just, it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. So I started to get to the end of my labor and I remember thinking, oh man, I don't know if they're going to get here in time. <laughs> um, cause my, my midwife had an assistant as well, who, somebody who's in training for midwifery. So, uh, they did happen to get there and they had about as much time to set everything out, um, to get ready. And I remember, she asked me a couple questions, but didn't interrupt much, which I really appreciated. And finally I said, I think I need to push. And she said, all right. So it was my first time having a baby without coached pushing. And I, I gotta say, I, I spent a lot of time visualizing in my mind what that moment would be like, because I, I'd never had, I'd never given birth 
um, not laying down on a bed on my back. And I had never given labor uh, without somebody telling me when to push and having monitors all over me and things like that. It was, I was nervous that I wouldn't be able to do it. Um, like really nervous that I, I wouldn't know how to do that. And it, it, so it was just a, like this amazing experience to just be so in tune with my body and with what was going on and to sense like, okay, this is the time. And I, pushed out Veronica. I was actually more kneeling. I had one knee up and um, the other down and I was kneeling because in between contractions, I was so tired that I was leaning over the edge of the birthing pool um, to get some respite because I was just, I was so exhausted. I'd been in labor for two, two days at that point. And I got Veronica out. I pushed her out in about, I don't know, a couple minutes. Um, it was very, very quick. And I had no, I didn't need any stitches or anything, even though she was posterior. Um, it, and it was so gentle. Like, this was the other thing that was crazy. She didn't cry. She was born and she didn't cry. I remember kind of leaning back, getting some help so I could lean back in the pool after I, I caught her. Like, I felt her come out and I caught her. It was crazy. That was another thing. I never... I tried to visualize what that would be like because I'd seen other women give labor like that after I started watching these videos. And I thought, how do you do that? Like, how do you push a baby out and catch them at the same time? And, you know, how do you, this just seems crazy to me because I just, yeah, I couldn't conceptualize it hardly. And, and yet I did it. It was instinctive. Um, when I first got her head out, I, I remember feeling her head and then, um, I pushed, some more. And I was just like, at that point, that last surge of energy, because I was just so ready to be done. And I caught her and I pulled her up to my chest and I got some help to lean back in the pool and she didn't cry. And, and I'd heard that that's normal. Um, but I just remember being in complete awe and I spent probably the first couple of minutes saying, Holy S H I T. <laughs> Sorry, little ears listening. I did it. Holy, I did it. Because I just didn't think that I would know how to do it without someone telling me when and how. And and I couldn't believe that I caught her. And she was just so beautiful. Like all of your kids, you give birth, and they're just so beautiful. And that those first few minutes, you're like, this is absolutely incredible. I'm, I'm holding my child. I'm holding this, this little human being I've been wanting to meet. And I remember thinking like, oh, God, I surrender. I surrender this moment to you. My, my whole um, labor, the thing that I kept meditating on was there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out all fear. It's in the first, uh, um, for the first letter of John, but yeah, it's just like, that was my, that was the thing. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out all fear. And as I held her, I thought, we're going to do this. This is going to be okay. We're going to do this. And then it was so cool because then, you know, we did get her to cry a little bit. Um, I think the midwife was just like a little worried. <laughs> she just seemed so wide eyed and just staring at me and was so content. Um, and she still is. She's a really content baby, generally speaking. Um, so easy. And praise God for that. It was like, I was so worried. And I, she ended up having oral ties and stuff too. And that was something that I was worried about. But, you know, after we kind of looked at some of that stuff, I, you know, finished labor. The last phase of labor is when you get your placenta out. And then I was helped out of the pool, cleaned up a bit and laid down in my own bed, which is amazing. And we just sat there like getting to know each other and bonding. And it was just such a special moment too. I mean, my husband could lay in bed with us and just stare in awe at this new human being. And then my children came home and they got to meet their sister before they went to bed for the night and my mother-in-law. And it was just like, wow, the, my kids have always had to wait 
a little bit to meet their siblings. Uh, my oldest was extremely disappointed that she didn't get to see uh, the labor. Uh, she didn't get to see me birth Veronica. But, you know, if we ever have any more kids, definitely, um, God willing, she would be able to be present for that too. So um, anyway, it was just such a powerful experience. And it taught me so much about what it means to surrender to God's will, especially to surrender your fertility to him. Because um, was it easy? No. But it he used the thing that I was afraid of the most to heal me and to to dig into those areas of my life that needed healing, the areas that I didn't even know needed healing at the time, because I just was so unaware um, for a long time of those things that lay dormant within me, those wounds that I had, that I had pushed away for so long. And he used my fear and this pregnancy and this child to bring about healing in that way, because I don't think I would have tackled it if it weren't for this sense of urgency that I had to start addressing these things. I had, for the sake of my family, I had to start dealing with these things. And I got to tell you, Veronica is like the easiest baby I've had. And I have a lot of questions as to why that might be. I don't know if it's because we had a home birth and there was no disruption. You know, we were able to just lay in bed together afterwards and we, there wasn't the poking and the prodding. Somebody else got to clean up my room. You know, the midwife and her assistant, they cleaned up our room, um, got everything out of there. But we just got to spend time together and we slept that night. Like I, after two days of being awake, there is no way that I am going to be waking up every two to three hours to try and nurse my newborn. Here's the thing. Your milk comes in anyway. And this is something that just so frustrates me. It's like, you're disrupting a mom who's just basically ran a marathon with her body. Like her, her body is responding that way. You have a child who also just endured a lot and a huge transition, um, and, and you're telling moms that you need to, they need to wake up every couple of hours to try and nurse their child because their milk won't come in. That's just not true. Do you know, we know that's not true. You have women who have had late term stillbirths and things like that. And their milk still comes in. That's part of the, the process. That's actually an aspect that's really hard for women after they, they have a loss is that their, their milk still comes in. And so their body is still responding to the child that they're supposed to be nourishing and they can't anymore. Um, or they they didn't get a chance to. So it just it just boggles my mind. And I do think that this really disrupts the bonding process um, because the woman is not her again, going back to the, how the body is integrated, her parasympathetic ner nervous system is not activated. She's in a stressed state, elevated levels of cortisol. There are things that are going to prevent her from bonding appropriately with that child. So anyway, I was like, I'm sleeping and Veronica's sleeping. We've had a long couple of days. And you know what? I, my milk came in, all the things happened that were supposed to happen. Um, and, and yeah, we did struggle with the oral ties thing. She did have to have her ties released. And that was a huge fear of mine because we had struggled so much with Elijah and, um, I wasn't sure there were just so many things with that. I could do a whole episode on oral ties alone. Um, but that was a big fear of mine and, and a cause of great anxiety for me. Some people, it's not a big deal to them. For me, um, it was a big deal for me because for many reasons, um, but everything from realizing that all my kids have had ties and issues and they were never diagnosed until my fourth child, um, to dealing with some of the specific issues with some of my children, um, whether that be Elijah and his sensory issues and temperamental issues to some of my older kids who, uh, have struggled with just different types of dysregulation. So, um, there were just so many things going on there that I was really afraid of. And, Veronica has done extremely well. The Lord has been so good to me and so faithful. Like he gave me exactly what I needed. Um, and, and two, I just feel like I feel so close to her because we, we did this thing together that, um, I just have learned through this process, really how important it is to trust my intuition as a mother. Um, I do feel like for the most part, my conscience is is formed properly, which is part of our duties as Christians, as Catholics, um, to have a properly formed conscience. And I think if you 
are there and it's rooted in sacred scripture, all these things and, and the, the truth that we have uh, being protected within the walls of our church and the sacraments, all of those things. Um, it's easier to trust your gut and your intuition um, because it's not going to steer you wrong. I mean, it's very rarely, I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, you'll never get it wrong. We're parents, we get things wrong all the time. Um, but when it comes to trusting how God designed our bodies, especially if, if our bodies are healthy or what have you, um, then, then those processes, they do what they're supposed to do. And I just feel like I have this unique bond thus far with Veronica because there hasn't been so much, there haven't been so many disruptions to that bond. And, um, I don't feel pressured to get out there and do all the things right away. I stayed home and I rested for weeks. Um, I didn't do a lot of stuff, to, um, that I normally would do because I actually prioritize resting because I realized how weird it is. I had a great experience with it. I know that there are women out there who don't have a great experience with it or they don't have access to it. And I'm not here to, you know, shame anybody or make anyone feel bad. That's not my point. My point is really that, uh, we have a lot of work to do culturally to reclaim our femininity. And this is one of those areas in which, um, I do think that collective wisdom of motherhood, uh, of birth, pregnancy, fertility, all those things, we have to do something different to reclaim that knowledge. And, Home birth to me is a huge component of that. Um, I learned so much more about myself, what I'm capable of uh, through God's goodness and his grace through this process. And I, I've healed a lot of those wounds in my life by, by addressing motherhood in a new way and, and through a new lens and looking at it through more of this, um, this gift and this incredible duty that we have as women. Um, and realizing the importance of how, how the need for us to take care of our bodies and and to look at them with a sense of reverence and awe because uh, because of what we are called to do in and through our bodies, you know, as we bring new life into the world, God willing. So uh, anyway, thank you so much for letting me share this story with you. I better uh, get done here because Elijah. <laughs> Elijah's done. He is done. But if you liked this episode, please hit the like button, subscribe, share it, and maybe consider becoming a patron. I could definitely use some more help offsetting the costs for this podcast. Um, so feel free to check out my Patreon page. I'll put a link in the description box. And please connect with me. Find me on social media. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, that's as much as I can handle right now. But uh, I'm definitely on there quite a bit. So feel free to reach out to me there as well. Thank you for listening to this episode of Integrated. May God bless you.